Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Kimberly Pearson, Ecosystem Scientist, Conservation and Restoration Project Manager from Waterton Lakes National Park, will be talking about Waterton Lakes National Park, Return of the Northern Leopard Frog. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in the Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Check out the PCAP website for more information about our upcoming Native Prairie Speaker Series. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by TransCanada Corporation, Canada and North Environmental Services, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly SAS, Information Services Corporation, Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, Inc., SASTEL, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by Waterton Lakes National Park. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about our presenter. Kimberly Pearson is an ecosystem scientist, conservation and restoration project manager with Parks Canada in Waterton Lakes National Park. She has worked on various amphibian and other conservation efforts in the Waterton region over the past 20 years. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Kimberly. Okay, wonderful. Hi everybody, can you, can you see my screen properly? Or is it my notes pages or my display? It's the uh, note pages that we see right now. Okay, I'll just fix that quickly. How's that? Perfect. That should be good. Okay, great, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for having me here, Caitlin. I'm really happy to present to everybody today on behalf of Parks Canada uh, as part of this PCAP webinar series. And I'll be speaking today on Waterton Lakes National Park's Northern Leopard Frog Restoration Project. And before I delve into the details of that exciting project, I'll just take a few moments to frame it in the context of Waterton Lakes National Park itself and the uh, Greater Grasslands Conservation and Restoration Project that we've been focused on here. So I'll start off with a brief orientation to Waterton Lakes National Park. The park is located in the extreme southwestern corner of Alberta, bordering BC on the west, Montana's Glacier National Park on the south, and Castle Wildland Provincial Park on the north, as well as privately owned ranch lands along the eastern flanks. And this is one of the most narrow points in the Rocky Mountain chain, and it's also a key part of the unique crown of the continent ecosystem. It's a very diverse place. There's a lot of diverse landscape, as well as diverse uh, life here. This is the traditional territory of Mitsitapi, the Blackfoot people. And besides the distinction of being protected as a national park, it is distinguished through several other designations. For example, the, the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park was the first established in the world. And this peace park is, is also designated by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. That was in 1995. And since 1979, Waterton Lakes National Park represents the core of the Waterton Biosphere Reserve, also um, designated by UNESCO. And finally, along with Glacier National Park, Waterton has more recently been designated as the world's first transboundary international dark sky preserved. So a special place on many fronts, including um, all those recognitions. So taking a closer look now, Waterton Lakes National Park is well known to be where the mountains meet the prairie, where the Great Plains literally sweep up the mountainsides and the valleys, and there are no foothills offering a transition. And this is one of the only places in the world that this occurs so abruptly. The renowned grasslands portion of Waterton Lakes National Park has been threatened by various factors in recent years. And to address that, we've been undertaking a multi-year, multifaceted project focused on conserving and restoring Waterton Lakes National Park's grasslands. This is part of Parks Canada's nationally funded conservation and restoration program. And I have the great pleasure of managing and collaborating on this project with a number of colleagues. We've had a great deal of success through this fifth and final year of the current project. 
But those on the call well know native grasslands are one of the most threatened ecosystems in the world and are irreplaceable. We've only begun to understand their importance in supporting wildlife and how their soils are built and the nearly unfathomable numbers of microbes and insects that support what we see above ground from below. Humans have tried, but we simply cannot recreate these native grassland ecosystems. So they're certainly worth, worth taking care of as best we can. Um, and these grasslands have been home to humans for millennia. Nowadays, several hundred thousand visitors annually experience the unique Waterton Lakes National Park landscape. They come here to recreate and restore. The mountains are often a draw to them, but the prairies also often capture hearts and imaginations. These highly productive, low elevation grasslands are a key place for wildlife to live and move from place to place, such as grizzly bears and elk, larger species like those, but also smaller species, including many species at risk, such as the common nighthawk, as you see there on the top left, the American badger on the bottom right, and the northern leopard frog, as you see on the top right there, and which I'll be speaking on in more depth shortly. So we know well that the grasslands are valuable and worthy of conservation. conservation. But now I'll speak briefly to some of the specific threats contributing to the declining health of our grasslands in Waterton Lakes National Park and how we've been addressing them through this conservation and restoration project. Over the course of the past 130 years, more than 20% of the park's grassland area was naturally converted to native shrub and tree growth where grass once dominated. So to illustrate this, this photo was taken in 1914. It was taken for those of you familiar with the park uh, from just north of the present day Red Rock Parkway looking northwest toward Bellevue Mountain. And you can see in this photo that low shrub and tree cover has been maintained by thousands of years worth of regularly occurring fires and by the presence of bison. But that has all changed 90 years later. In 2004, when this photo was taken, significant encroachment by aspen, conifers, those are Douglas fir trees in the foreground, and shrubs, those are all evident on that same site. Really dramatic change. And another 13 years on, in the fall of 2017, fire has returned to this area of the park a few times in the form of two prescribed fires and also a major wildfire, the Kenai wildfire. And the effects of that fire are visible in this image. I'll speak to that later in my presentation. But through, through these fires, shrub and tree cover in this area of the park has been reduced and we'll need to maintain these gains with prescribed fire into the future. It may not be really visible in that photo, but, but the measurements that we've been taking are showing us that there, there has been a reduction in shrub and aspen cover. The Parks Canada has been making a concerted effort to reverse this trend of declining presence and health of grasslands through several means. So as just noted, we've been returning prescribed fire to the landscape. And this photo was taken following the prescribed fire in 2014. Invasive plants, such as spotted knapweed, as you see there on the top left, are another of the primary threats to the health of our grasslands. We have many dedicated volunteers here in the park and a sizable restoration crew, which focuses on manual and chemical weed control, inventory and monitoring through a really innovative system that we've developed just for that. We've also been revegetating disturbed sites, such as this gravel pit, using plants that have been grown from seeds collected in the park by volunteers, largely. And we're also studying wildlife movement within a constricted, constricted portion of the Waterton Valley and making recommendations on how to maintain their ability to move through this landscape in the long term. So this is a grizzly bear captured on a remote wildlife camera, just close to my office, actually. <laughs> so as in any well-rounded restoration program, engaging Canadians in this work is a very key component of this conservation and restoration project. We involve thousands of people annually in this important work through volunteer events, interpretive and education opportunities, uh, which include an award-winning overnight camp for grade five students. So restoring northern leopard frogs to the grasslands region of Waterton Lakes National Park is another component of the project that I'll focus on for the remainder of my presentation. The species has been considered extirpated from the park since they were last observed here in 1980. The causes of their decline are unknown, but thought to be linked possibly to disease and drought. 
The frogs are an important link between grasslands and wetlands. They prey readily on insects er, and are an important prey item themselves. And as many people know, amphibians, being amphibians, they are uh, important represent, represent, representatives of uh, wetland and just ecosystem health. So despite their absence from the region over the past several decades, many Southern Albertans have fond memories of these frogs being in abundance, as indicated by this small painting that I recently came across in a Waterton art gallery. Now let's just briefly go over a, a rapid Northern Leopard Frog Identification 101. So from this image, this is a, a video, which I'll play in a moment, but you can get an idea here, of, of, and, and all, from all the other photos that I'm showing through this presentation of, of uh, what the frogs look like. So adults are about 50 to 130 millimeters in length, or two to five inches. Juvenile frogs are just smaller replicas of the adult. They can be green or brown colored as their base color, with pale white undersides and white ridges running down either side of, the side of their back. Their most telling feature is the very dark, large, leopard-like spots on their backs, heads, and legs. And if you look closely, these are each surrounded by a narrow, light-colored halo. So I'll play this video for about 30 seconds to give you an idea of what this fellow's call sounds like. Uh, it can be described as a guttural snore followed by a grunting or chuckling sound. Uh, and you will hear striped chorus frogs in the background of this video. Um, those frogs sound, they're very small, they're only about an inch long, and they're very loud though, and they're very common, and they sound like somebody running their fingers along the teeth of a comb. So as you, as you listen to this, um, I hope the, the video and the sound plays, I'll, I'll give it a try anyway, um, and you'll know that the, the leopard frog is making its call when you see the sides of its neck, which are sort of ballooned out in this photo, um, they're expanding as the frog makes its sound. Let's see how this works. Okay, I'm not sure whether <laughs> whether you could hear that or not. Um, I have no way of seeing whether whether you can whether you heard it. Um, but uh, at least you saw kind of a neat video showing um, what they look like when they're when they're making their sound when they're making their calls. So compared to other prairie amphibians, northern leopard frogs have relatively complex habitat needs. For breeding, they require wetlands that are free of predaceous fish such as this one here. Adults rely on open grasslands in which to forage, and they're generally not found in heavily treed areas. And unlike for frogs and other frogs in the region, which burrow into mud in and around their breeding ponds through the winter, adult and juvenile le northern leopard frogs overwinter in highly oxygenated water bodies, such as lakes, spring-fed ponds, creeks, or rivers. So unfragmented proximity of all three of these habitat types is critical to supporting healthy populations of these frogs. And further, connectivity between populations is important to, to supporting regional populations of them. And these very particular habitat needs of the species very likely played a key role in its decline. So as noted earlier, the reasons for the species decline are unknown, but it's thought that disease and drought did play a role. The Western boreal or prairie and prairie population of the species was last assessed by OSEWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, in 2009 as one of special concern. It's designated now as such under Schedule 1 of the Species at Risk Act. And as described in the COSEWIC status report, the species remains widespread but has experienced considerable range construction and loss of population. The species is experiencing increased isolation of remaining populations, and the species is adversely affected by habitat conversion and fragmentation, the introduction of game fish, collecting for research and education purposes in the past mainly, 
this pesticide contamination susceptibility to emerging diseases is also, is also an issue for them. The lower elevations of Waterton Lakes National Park and adjoining low elevation historic records. The species was so abundant and widespread that it wasn't readily recorded before the population started to decline through the 1970s. Recording them at that time could perhaps be likened to recording observations of American robins or black-billed magpies, very common species today. So let's hope that we don't see declines in those species in the future. So this is almost certainly a very great underrepresentation of the species' actual abundance and, and range within the park. In 2003, Parks Canada hired a student to conduct a thorough survey of the park to determine whether the species was present or not. Unfortunately, the local extirpation that had largely been anecdotal in nature to that point was confirmed. No observations of leopard frogs were made other than this very strange specimen that was planted as a prank. Based on those null results, a Northern Leopard Frog Management Plan was completed for Waterton Lakes National Park in 2007. The plan laid out steps to re-establish a self-sustaining Northern Leopard Frog population in Waterton Lakes National Park, focusing on historical and potential breeding locations. And from 2007 to 2010, park staff followed through on that reintroduction plan. 22 egg masses were translocated from sites elsewhere in southern Alberta, resulting in over 75,000 tadpoles being released into two separate sites. Egg masses were protected in flo floating enclosures that kept them safe from predators, other than one security breach by a crafty raccoon. So those are uh, buckets with pool noodles <laughs> cut and, and attached to their sides to keep them afloat. And the, the top and the bottom of the buckets are are protected by mesh or hardware cloth. Visual and acoustic monitoring efforts were completed at both the sites that the eggs were transferred into through 2007, 2007 through 2010, and the monitoring continued through 2012. During the year, were observed at one site but not at the other, which was found to contain trout and likely, which likely had a large part in um, reintroduction efforts not being successful there. Evidence of overwinter survival of the frogs released at these sites was observed on two occasions. However, the frogs were not observed to persist. No frogs were observed at or near the reintroduction sites after 2009. And unfortunately, despite a lot of hard work by park staff and supportive partners, this reintroduction effort was not successful. However, park staff, namely my colleague, Barb Johnston, with whom I'm now working on this leopard frog project, didn't give up on the idea of trying again. We decided to undertake another restoration effort with a few different approaches integrated. In particular, we're focusing now on transferring eggs to wetlands that are located in close proximity and or directly connected to suitable overwintering sites to increase the chances of frogs finding and successfully overwintering and making the trip back and forth between breeding and overwinter sites at least twice before their re reproductive age. Sites in previous efforts may have been too wooded or too far away from overwintering water bodies for frogs to successfully establish. And something else that we're doing differently this time, uh, we, we don't have the time or the capacity to study it and determine whether it, it does actually have an effect, but some advice that we received um, several years ago from a fellow named Fred Schuler from Ontario um, was that we should consider um, the orientation of the frogs, their sort of genetically ingrained orientation um, between their breeding sites and their overwintering sites and, and doing what we could to line up um, how frogs are programmed genetically um, over many generations to, to move between their habitats. So um, we've taken note of, of what direction the frogs are, are likely to move toward their overwintering habitats from their breeding sites in this current effort and tried to match them up as best that we can in Waterton. And again, we're not sure what the effect might be, but um, it's a fairly simple thing to do and it, and it may just be making a difference. So this time, to seek out egg sources, we traveled the province away to Grasslands National Park in southern Saskatchewan 
where northern leopard frogs have been abundant and populations appear to be healthy to in order to collect eggs. Um, in southern Alberta, populations are, are fairly fragmented and, and not necessarily thriving as well as we would like um, before we take um, more eggs from them. So we've gone to Grasslands National Park and also it's administratively it's, it's simple to uh, on paper for one federal park to go to another to, uh, to borrow eggs and to work in partnership. That's working out well. So in 2005, we, we started going to Grasslands National Park and we were pleased to find a great abundance of egg masses. Um, as you can see in this photo, there are several egg masses in, in this image in close proximity to one another. And we didn't have trouble finding eggs that year. 2016 was a very dry year. Many of the breeding ponds and grasslands were completely dry. So we had to work hard to find water. And where we did find water, we usually did find some egg masses as well. So not in the great abundance that we've seen in 2015. So we, in each of 2015 and 2016, we took six egg masses um, from various sites in grasslands. So that was far less than half of what we had observed in each site. We wanted to make sure that our impacts for the population there were very small. So we only took a very small proportion of the egg masses seen. We very carefully placed one whole egg mass in a several gallon thermos container. Um, and as you can see, egg, egg, you know, leopard frog egg masses are uh, about grapefruit sized. And as they get older, they are less compact, but uh, they start out as a fairly globular form attached in shallow water, to, usually to a, a piece of vegetation quite strongly. So we had to cut um, a piece of grass that these eggs were attached to below the egg mass to put them in this container. And we filled it up with um, pond water and transported them very carefully back to Alberta, about an eight hour drive. Vibrations can cause deformities in the embryos. And uh, <clears throat> volunteers, <clears throat> we, had, we had enlisted the help of, of several volunteers to help us build the enclosures that the eggs were placed in. When we got back to the park, here's a photo of a, of a work bee where we had all that enthusiastic volunteer help, which we really appreciated. So again, we set these egg masses, one egg mass per enclosure in the ponds. Um, we put two egg masses in each of three sites here in Waterton. The same three sites over the course of the two years. Here's what the leopard frogs appear like when they're newly hatched. Those are leopard frog hatchlings. They're about uh, a couple centimeters long, really small. And if you were to see them in a pond, you might not even notice them because they look so much like a little pine needle or just a piece of debris on the bottom of the pond. When they're first hatched, they just sort of hang out. They don't do much swimming and they, they just absorb their egg yolk. Um, that's what they feed on for the first number of days before they become more free swimming. And once they become more free swimming, um, I guess I don't have a photo to show you here, but uh, we wait until they're, they've reached a stage where they can swim with great agility. Um, they're very fast swimmers, swimming tadpoles, and we wait until they're able to swim quite well and able to avoid predation in the ponds as best as possible. So we, once we release them into their pond, uh, we let them grow undisturbed. We don't go back a lot usually. We might go back once a summer just to take a look and see if we see any larger tadpoles present. Um, but otherwise, we let them be and, and try to avoid disturbance to their, their habitat as much as possible. But we do return in August and we conduct visual surveys. We walk around the perimeter of the pond to see if we see any young of the year. And we also have been using acoustic monitoring, the small recording units that we either bolt onto a tree or leave on a stand next to a pond. And we set those recording units to to record um, this year, we were using 15 minute intervals um, through the afternoon and, and overnight. And then we review those files and see whether we pick up any leopard frog recordings. It saves people having to go out there night after night <laughs> um, or day after day and, and listen for leopard frog calls. And we have picked leopard frog calls up on, um, on a couple of our sites. 
So I'm, I'm really happy to report that in 2015 and 16, we found many young of the year frogs at two of those three sites that we placed eggs into. Uh, so the third site, we have not seen any sign of them at, and that might be because it's adjacent to a very, very large wetland that they may have uh, scattered off into and been very difficult to, to uh, identify and to find. But at those other two sites that we're focusing on our, our monitoring efforts on, we found many young of the year frogs that, and this is an example of three of them. Uh, and that was really good news. So in 2017 and 18, due to difficulties in locating eggs in grasslands, uh, we weren't able to bring any eggs back to Waterton. We, we did make an attempt to, but it just it didn't work out. Uh, but such is the challenge in sourcing eggs from a province away even though we did have the help of Grasslands National Park staff. Um, however, the frogs did help out on that front and they were found to have bred successfully on their own for the first time in about 40 years as of last year in 2017, which was, which was really um, another, a, a, the first real good sign of success for this effort. And these are two ha very happy summer students who came upon uh, Northern Leopard Frogs uh, young of the year at a site where we didn't place them last summer. So this was great news because it indicates that the frogs have colonized at least one additional site and established breeding there on their own. Another another um, sign of success. And so adults and juveniles were seen here and also at a fourth site, which would be a newly colonized site this year. We're doing work right now to determine whether they may have bred at that fourth site. Um, as well as this, this other third site too, this year. So the Kenai wildfire that I referred to earlier took place um, on September 11th of 2017 overnight. This is a, an example of what that fire looked like. It was a very fast moving, very, very intense um, fire with very extreme behavior that moved through all eco regions of the park through the alpine down through the grasslands over the course of a number of hours that night. Um, so we had a lot of questions about how the frogs would have fared through this very intense, fast moving fire. And given their, given their ecology, we figured that some may have been killed by the wildfire, that were perhaps in upland areas. But due to the very hot and dry season last year, most of the frogs we figured were probably sticking fairly close to their aquatic habitat. And we know now, having done some monitoring this season, that, uh, oh, sorry, I should just mention here first that, uh, that a lot of um, ponds did get burned right up to the edges and some of them got burned through even in this fire. Um, but wetlands are really resilient habitats that are adapted to wildfire and vegetation regrows pretty rapidly in these very moist environments. And nutrients released by wildfires are, are readily processed in these pond habitats. So, Robust amphibian populations within healthy landscapes are typically resilient to the effects of wildfire. That seems to be the case here with northern leopard frogs, um, because we now know that northern leopard frogs survived wildfire readily enough to breed in those same two reintroduction sites that they, they had last year as well. Uh, so they don't seem to have skipped a beat. We've seen lots of chunky, healthy tadpoles in those sites this summer. We will continue to conduct surveys. We'll do um, young of the year surveys. We'll, we'll look around those same sites this summer here, this next month, to see whether um, the frogs have successfully metamorphosed and, and moved away from their breeding ponds and toward their overwintering habitat. And um, we'll continue to, continue to make plans and see we might move um, more eggs into the, in the future just to round out the genetic um, base that's here because really we only have, uh, as far as we know, um, four egg masses <laughs> have, have contributed to the, the establishment of this population at this point. So we would like to round them out if possible to, to ensure the, the long-term health of the population. And we're also looking at, uh, at measures of success. <clears throat> this is from a uh, case study put together by Leah Randall and, and several others just recently. Um, looking at the measures of success for reintroductions of northern leopard frogs. So the first is 
whether we introduce eggs hatch and tadpoles complete metamorphosis, and we've checked that off uh, over the last few years. Second measure is that frogs overwinter successfully. Again, we've checked that off. We've seen the frogs um, return to their breeding ponds and, and actually breed. We know that that's what's happening. We also observed Colin during the breeding period. We have uh, observed that through those recording units that I was mentioning and just in, in, uh, in person as well. Evidence of successful breeding in the wild as indicated by wild bred eggs, tadpoles, or frogs. Again, that's a check mark uh, based on the, the uh, frog whips that we saw last year and the tadpoles that we've seen so far this year. Uh, some or all life stages are detected at least three years post release. Um, that is the case here now. We've, we've released our first batch of leopard frog eggs in, in 2015, so this is the third third year after release, and we've got that checked off too. Um, and then the last point, or one of the last points, is long-term population sustainability without supplementation. So that will be many years into the future. We're talking greater than 10 years. So we have a while to wait before we can assess that. Uh, but, but hopefully this trajectory will continue and, and we can check that off eventually as well. And, and the final measure of success is evidence of colonization and successful breeding at additional sites to those where they were translocated to. So again, we have noted that um, colonization um, and successful breeding at one site, um, potentially a second where we have seen adults and, and juvenile frogs. So they do appear to be moving from those core sites that they know as home and, uh, and showing indications of setting up in other locations as well. So that's, that summarizes the Waterton Lakes National Park effort on leopard frog restoration. So far so good. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge too a project that's being undertaken by a, a partner of ours, the Waterton Biosphere Reserve Association. They are working on a project, um, as you can see there from the poster, it's, it's not easy being green. <laughs> um, getting attention toward the species in the Waterton Biosphere Reserve area, on the, especially on the private lands in the area where um, leopard frogs may, may exist still, um, or there may have been historical populations that were not recorded. So it's an it's a attempt to round out information on the species in the region and an attempt to perhaps help link existing populations. Um, through habitat work and, and potentially um, perhaps maybe in, in the future some relocations as well where it's appropriate. So I encourage you if you're interested in learning more about that or if you live within the biosphere reserve area, um, please contribute your observations of leopard frogs currently or historically. We, we're interested in hearing, in hearing stories about that and, um, and Waterton Lakes National Park is a partner in that project. Right on. Thank you very much, Kim. Oh, I just had one more slide, Caitlin. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So just a, a quick summary slide. So we found early success in restoring self-sustaining populations of northern leopard frogs to Waterton Lakes National Park, but the project isn't over yet and we have work yet to accomplish. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge our partners in this project, including the uh, Parks Canada staff and Grasslands National Park, um, the Calgary Zoological Society, um, Alberta Environment and the Waterton Biosphere Reserve Association. We look forward to seeing how the frogs fare in the future in Waterton and welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really great presentation. Uh, I had no idea about this work going on between grasslands and Waterton. It's really neat when um, you know different provinces and different parks can work together. Um, to all of our listeners out there, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, please feel free to type into the question section of the webinar dashboard. And I would just like to remind everyone too that when you leave this presentation, there will be an email um, or a pop-up with a quick questionnaire. If you don't mind filling it out, it'll just take a minute and that'll help us to continue our Native Prairie Speaker Series into the future. Um, we do have a couple questions here. So Kim, I was wondering if Waterton has any plans to bring northern leopard frogs to nearby land outside of the park boundary. Whether whether Parks Canada has plans to 
put frogs yeah, outside. Yeah, to the work pool. with landowners, or is there any organization in place with that? Right. So that would be the Waterton Biosphere Reserve Association project. Okay. Uh, or it would fit in within there and uh, the work of, I guess, Alberta Environment, um, perhaps the Calgary Zoo as well. Yeah, there are several partners that are that are working on private lands in Alberta and. Um, uh, yeah, Parks Canada wouldn't lead that sort of effort, but um, would certainly be interested in supporting it however we could or, or encouraging it because, um, as mentioned, regional populations um, really would be helpful to ensure the, the species' long-term um, longevity and sustainability. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. um, another listener would like to know, or he says, thanks, Kimberly, for this presentation on a good news story. Um, I think you mentioned at the outset that you were in the fifth and last year of a conservation restoration program, and he's wondering if there's any commitments um, for next year. And this is from Ian with Alberta Wilderness Association. Hey, right, yeah, good. Thank you for your comments. And and yes, this is a great news story. It's it's really a pleasure to share it. Um, and yes, this is the fifth and final year of the funding that this project is currently supported through, but uh, yes, good and more good news that uh, there's another conservation and restoration project coming online. Um, it's just in the sort of development phase this year, but it's based on aquatic restoration in Waterton Lakes National Park. And, and this project, the leopard frogs, um, does fall under that. So it should continue um, under that funding umbrella. But I should just note too that uh, it's really not a costly effort. You know, there's there's very minimal costs in this work. Um, you know, there's staff time is the most um, costly of, of it all. And it does take some time, of course, to coordinate, um, you know, other than travel and some pool noodles <laughs> and uh, thermoses, it, it really doesn't cost a whole lot to actually do this work, which is maybe something important for people to keep in mind if, if it's something that they're considering working on in the future. Thank you for that answer. Um, another listener would like to know um, how you came up with the idea of the buckets and pool noodles. Hmm. It was not my idea. <laughs> I think that's something that uh, maybe came from Dave Prescott with Alberta Environment. Um, I think it's something that's just sort of been a typical design used for leopard frog reintroduction in the past, in Alberta at least. Um, and, and I should note too that, that this, these sorts of efforts have been underway since the 80s actually. There have been reintroduction efforts taking place in the province for, for quite some time. So yeah, uh, it's like I don't have a drawing, <laughs> graphic drawings or anything of it, but uh, if anybody's interested, please feel free to connect with me and we can give you some ideas on, on how to build them. It's, it just takes a quick trip to the, the hardware store really to pick up all the supplies. Thank you. Um, looks like there's one more question here. Um, one of our listeners would like to know uh, how you can tell the difference of age in frogs. Um, I guess you referred to a slide there with young of the year. Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, adult frogs are, I think I said, three to two to five inches long. Um, young of the year are usually about a couple of inches long. Um, are up to two inches long, and then they get progressively larger as they mature, and, and by a couple of years, they are pretty full size. Um, they might keep growing a bit um, as, they, as they get older. Um, I've heard some people refer to them as bullfrogs because they're so big. <laughs> some of them get really large, and I've seen some really large ones as well, um, the more mature they get. Um, so yeah, the smaller the frog, the, the younger it likely is, and um, that's probably the best rule of thumb. So say under under two inches is a is a pretty young frog, and then uh, over two to five inches is is quite uh, more of an adult. I hope that's okay. Helps. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Ian has a question again. Our listener Ian out there. Um, he says we've seen severe droughts in the past. How did northern leopard frogs survive? That's a good question. So that might be. Um, partly why they de have declined. Um, so yes, severe droughts, they are a grassland prairie species. So yes, they have um, been adapted to, to somewhat to droughts. Um, and I, I guess nowadays they're dealing with a lot of other factors as well that are maybe confounding the effects of the drought. So when they declined in, in this region um, in the 70s, uh, you know, there was a lot else going on. There were 
there were emerging diseases like chytrid fungus, for example, um, that that you know may have have had a, a negative effect on the population, and drought could have exacerbated that. And um, yeah, they do definitely require breeding uh, like wet habitats to to survive at least over winter while they're waiting. Um, you know, they can maybe wait a few years or a couple years between um, having wetlands for breeding that are that are suitable or suitably wet, you know, full of water. Um, but, you know, after a few years, the population will start, they won't be able to continue breeding at that site. So they'll be relying on, on um, populations from nearby. And as I was mentioning, they are, uh, are quite, quite high needs as far as their habitat preferences go so so their habitats are can be sort of scattered and isolated and um, so that makes it complicated for them so having having populations that are as, as close in proximity to one another as possible is helps them be more resilient and, and with more connectivity between them so in in this day um, those are things that we need to think carefully about for the species because uh, Droughts aren't going to go away necessarily, um, and, and other factors are, are still complicating things for them. So um, maybe I've overanswered your question now, but hopefully that helps. Yes. Um, a listener named Emily says, "I'm heading to Waterton this July. Are there specific places I can learn or see more about the restoration work that this team has been working on?" Oh, good question. Oh, in August. Sorry. In August. <laughs> Great, Emily. Um, I'm glad you're coming. That's fantastic. Um, yes, uh, those those um, interpretation and education opportunities and volunteer opportunities I've been mentioning um, are all profiled on our website. If you go there, you can find listings of interpretive events and volunteer events. Um, you can sign up to get the volunteer newsletter if you want and to see what's going on in August. I know um, there is one event um, centered not around leopard frogs, but long-toed salamanders. <laughs> um, it's happening August 9th. And yeah, those are great ways to get involved and to learn more about not just this leopard frog project, but, but the greater um, conservation and restoration project focused on the grasslands. So I encourage you to check those out. And she says, thank you. Um, one of our listeners is wondering what happens if there's northern leopard frogs observed in a pond and then the pond dries up throughout the summertime. Where do the frogs go and how does that affect them? That's a good question. I guess it depends on the timing of that. So um, in a good water year, hopefully the water will last long enough that the, that the eggs can um, hatch and the tadpoles can, can uh, metamorphose into froglets. Um, and the warmer the water, typically the faster the development goes for amphibians. So if there's shallow, warm water through a warm summer, those tadpoles will hopefully grow quite quickly. But it still probably takes a couple of months from start to finish. Um, so yeah, they do need water, um, sufficient water in, in their habitat um, for, for probably a couple months. Uh, and then, but if they, so once they, once they leave the pond, um, with their legs and are able to to survive on land, they often will stay around the wet area or whatever wet area might be remaining at, at their their breeding pond, and then uh, they will make their way eventually to their overwintering site, which might be a river close by or a creek, um, or if they're breeding in a spring-fed pond, then they probably will just stay there all summer, and and then go um, in there over the winter. And I should mention too that they spend time on, over the winter apparently under ice. They, um, they stay relatively active under ice. They don't just burrow into the mud at the bottom necessarily, but they have been seen by uh, Dave Prescott and his team They've uh, with Alberta Environment have, have um, noted leopard frogs moving under ice through the winter. Um, so that gives you a bit of an idea, I guess, of where they, where they go, but they, they definitely like wet areas. But as I mentioned too, they do like to feed in upland grass, open grasslands as well. The adults spend a lot of time in those areas, probably especially at night when it's, when it's cool. Wow, that's really interesting. I had no idea about them being active under ice. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that, brings us to the end of all the questions that we have here. So with that, I really want to thank you, Kim, for your time today and um, 
making the time for this awesome presentation and it was really informative. I know I learned a lot. Um, to all of our listeners there, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. And you're welcome to rewatch it or pass this link on to anyone who wasn't able to attend today. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.